of these are out there somewhere. Viewers should stop looking or anything. They can provide you with a tape. Or I appreciate that. They've, they've done it before. I have to say their tape is usually a lot better than mine. Mind if I put this here? Is that no, not at all. Mr. President, I, I'd like to say to you that my purpose here is less to try to get a headline than to ask you about some of the things that have happened in the course of the presidency. But there is one issue that didn't come up at all last night at your news conference. Perhaps it surprised you as it did us, and that's the issue of Afghanistan. And I wanted to ask you whether you, you think the Soviets are really going to withdraw uh, from Afghanistan, uh, withdraw their troops, and if so, why? Well, I believe they are, and uh, Colin Powell and, and uh, George Schultz have been there in the Soviet Union and come back. They're convinced that, that uh, they really want to, uh, want to get out of there. I think that uh, a large part of that could be the, the economic situation in the Soviet Union and the fact that after going on nine years, uh, uh, it's still a, a, a stalemate. So I think that... Uh, there's reason to believe that they, they really want out. How much of a role has the, the support that we have given to the, uh, to the Afghan rebels had to do with this Soviet decision, in your, in your view? Well, I, I think it would only have it to do with the decision on the, on the basis that uh, as long as the Mujahideen were being supplied with uh, weapons and ammunition, uh, they just couldn't be defeated. You see, it's, most people don't understand that when you're up against a kind of guerrilla operation, the normal military has to outnumber the guerrillas roughly 10 to 1 uh, to be equal because of the nature of the way they fight, the strike and disappear and so forth. And uh, they've been a very effective fighting force, the Mujahid Adin. Uh, do you... Uh what do you think the prospects are now uh, for you and uh, Mr. Gorbachev uh, actually signing a treaty in Moscow that would reduce uh, uh, strategic nuclear arsenals, as you proposed, by 50 percent? Well, that would be nice if it could happen, but I have to tell you that uh, common sense indicates that the time is, is uh, too limited for us to really think that we could uh, bring a treaty ready for signature to, to that meeting. It would be nice if we could, and we're not going to slow down or anything, but it is so much, this one is so much more complicated with regard to verification and everything else than the uh, INF treaty, which we uh, were able to bring together, but even that took a few months to do. So uh, we're not going to be disappointed if, if uh, in fact, we're, we're not at this moment anticipating that it would be ready for signature then. If, if you can't get it signed there, are you going to uh, try to get it uh, wrapped up during your presidency? Or, or, are you, uh, or do you see uh, perhaps announcing those things you do agree on and leaving a foundation for the next administration to build on? Well, I believe with the amount of time that would still be remaining that uh, if there's sincerity on both sides with regard to getting such an agreement, and I think there is. I think that could be done, yes, before uh, my term expired. But uh, we just feel that to, uh, to even speak of having hopes of having it by the time, by the time of the summit or pressing that hard, uh, uh, it'll be fruitless, and, and uh, we should just keep on doing the best that we can. and. Uh, take it when the time comes. You've now, uh, you'll be meeting with Mr. Gorbachev for the fourth time, the most uh, we, uh, contact between a, a U.S. and Soviet president since World War II uh, uh, period, I believe. Uh, do, do, you, do you think he really is a different kind of, of uh, leader than the, than the Soviets have had before? Yes, I do, having met most of them. Uh, I think that uh, and this is just my own theory. He might uh, give you a different answer. I think that one difference is that he is the first leader that has come along who has <coughs> gone back before Stalin. 
and that he is trying to do what uh, Lenin was teaching. And it was when, with Lenin's death, Stalin actually reversed many of the things. Lenin had programs that he called the New Economics and things of that kind. And I've known a little bit about Lenin and what he was advocating, and I think that this in Glasnost and Perestroika and all that, that uh, this is much more smacking of Lenin than of Stalin. And I think that this is what he's, what he's tried to do. The, does, the, does the world look different to you now than it did when you entered the, uh, this Oval Office seven and a half years ago? You're the first two-term president since Dwight Eisenhower. You're in your eighth year. Uh, does, does, do you have a different, different view of, of the Soviets, a different view of, 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 of anything in the world you deal with? Well, when you, for that one specific, you take the Soviets, remember that in my first coming to office and for a few years there, uh, they kept dying on me. <laughs> they, they had three, uh, uh, th three leaders, and, uh, and they were, I think, of a different uh, philosophy than, uh, than uh, this one. But uh, f generally, and for that subject, you know, I, I have to remember that there weren't too many surprises. First of all, uh, a governor's job is an executive job, and you know that you sit at the desk where the buck does stop, and when the decisions have to be made, you have to make them. And even with regard to the principal difference, which would be foreign policy, uh, I recall to you that a former president several times asked me to represent him abroad in meetings with heads of state. I had been in 18 different countries in trips of that kind before I came to this job. So it wasn't a complete uh, sudden immersion, immersion in uh, foreign policy. I guess I wasn't, I, I know that, but I, I was thinking more of whether your own opinions of, of dealing with crises or dealing with uh, uh, difficult foreign policy or domestic problems had changed during this, this period of time you've been in office? Well, Lou, maybe, maybe I was blessed in one way. When I became governor of California, I walked into a situation that was <coughs> very similar to the one I walked into here. If you will recall that even though California's Constitution said you had to have a balanced budget, and the new governor in California comes in in the middle of the fiscal year. And I came in and found that while it had been sort of glossed over during the campaign, there was a sizable deficit already piled up in that first year. And I had to, within six months, uh, wasn't anyone else I could pass it to, I had to resolve that and wind up the year with a balanced budget. And uh, so coming in here with uh, the economic things that we had and the uh, double-digit inflation and so forth, uh, again, it was almost like a, like a repeat. And uh, the other things, the, uh, the things of somebody handing you a piece of paper every night that told you what you're going to be doing every half hour the next day, <laughs> that wasn't new to me. That, that happened in California, too. Uh, See, so you're saying essentially that the, the kinds of problems that you had to deal with and the way you dealt with them, you'd already uh, had formed your, your pattern of doing that while you were governor of California. Yes, it was one, if you remember there, of uh, delivering authority back to local communities, counties and, and communities that uh, I didn't think were properly uh, functions of the state government. Uh, here we've called the program federalism because I've, I think that over the years and over the decades the federal government has uh, assumed authority and autonomy that properly belonged back at state government. So we have a program called federalism and uh, that, that was not new. And the, the whole economic philosophy of reducing government, government's authority and all. And you know, this wasn't new. This has been coming on for a long time. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for president the first time, 
on the Democratic ticket in 1932. In his platform was the promise to return to the states and local governments authority and autonomy that he said had been unjustly seized by the federal government. Well, by the time I got here, it not only had been unjustly seized, they had added to it. <laughs> Nothing had been accomplished in reducing. Another, the another one of uh, FDR's promises, as you remember, was to balance the budget. And it was also yes. something you wanted to do. <clears throat> yes. And without going into the business of who is responsible for the deficit, you're going to leave office. With, there is going to be a sizable deficit. <clears throat> do you think that this is going to have a, a, a negative consequence on the next uh, generations? Is this, is this, this going to be a, a, a real burden for, for the country? Well, it's a burden. There's no question about that. But at the same time, it is not the disaster some people proclaim. Now, for me to say that is really a reversal of roles, because way back before I ever thought I would be a governor, when I was just out making speeches on the mashed potato circuit about things that I thought should be changed uh, in the governance of the nation, uh, I was complaining about the fact that for almost 60 years now, with only eight single-year exceptions, this country has been running a deficit. Now, the deficits today uh, look so much bigger, and it's true. They have become a part of the structure. The Maybe you've heard me use this or explain this term. Back in the middle 60s, when in Johnson's regime, they launched the War on Poverty and a great many social reforms and so forth. In the 15 years from 1965 to 1980, before we came here, the budget, federal budget, increased to roughly five times what it had been. The deficit increased to 38 times what it had been. And so the problem was, was still here, but when I I'm covering for the fact that I said I don't, don't think disaster. Remember this one thing about that no one seems to pay any attention to. The great burden of the interest. That's a great part of our, one of the major factors in our budget right now is the interest. But who gets that interest? And you find out then that a great many institutions, universities, educational institutions of all kinds, that part of their endowment are government bonds. And so a lot of that interest is going to them. And a lot of that interest is going to individual Americans who are, uh, this is a part of their saving instead of putting in the bank or something. So instead of it being something that is just disappearing down a rat hole, uh, it's a kind of a redistribution, you might say, of national wealth in that these institutions and so forth are of uh, getting this interest from the government. Now, maybe some of them would have to be getting straight grants from the government if they were not getting that, that interest. So, uh, no, I don't think it's disaster. I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to do better. And uh, from the very first that we were here, every budget that I have sent up, as the law requires that I send up, the Congress uh, added to that that budget. The only place they were willing to cut, and are still that way, is the defense budget. But unfortunately, I had inherited also, as president, a, a defense situation in which on any given day, uh, fully half the military aircraft in this country couldn't fly for lack of spare parts. Naval vessels tied up because they either lacked spare parts or didn't have crew. And I campaigned on the basis that even faced with a deficit, where it came to national security, national defense, that's the prime function of the federal government. I told audience after audience when I was campaigning that even faced with that deficit problem, I would have to come down on the side of augmenting the defense. Now, as I say, it was trimmed back time after time. In one five-year period since I've been here, the Congress cut a total of $125 billion from my defense uh, budgets. Now, you, they could take credit and say, well, we were fighting the deficit, but were they? In that same five years, they added $250 billion to domestic spending over and above what I'd asked for. Uh, 
I, w I wanted to ask you just one more Soviet question, which is sort of, this is a good place to ask it because this SDI was a creation of your administration. And I remember you saying many times that you had a background as a labor negotiator, that in negotiations you're, you, you're, you're, you're trying to get an agreement, both sides have to get something. And I'm wondering whether, whether you have a formula, whether there is a formula, that would allow you to preserve SDI as this research and development program and still satisfy the Soviets in some, in some way on that issue. Is there, is there well, any uh, meeting ground possible? Yeah, I can't see that at all as a bargaining chip. In the first place, they've spent 20 times as much as we have on defense programs in spite of ABM. They've been doing this for years. They just weren't as fast at it as we might be able to be. And I think that one of the reasons that made them try to use it as a bargaining chip, which they would buy it with some arms reductions and so forth, uh, was because knowing our technology, our ability and things of that kind, they were afraid and are afraid that we'll come up with it first. Now, what probably scares them, I would say that we'd come up first, remember, that if they had now an almost foolproof defense against our nuclear missiles, at the same time they've got their nuclear vi missiles, they would have the ability for a first strike. They could hit us, and when we fired back, we couldn't hit them. They see the same thing for us. If we get SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, and we still have these missiles that we have, they see a first strike capability. Now the difference is, and it's almost impossible to convince them, we don't have any intention of a first strike. You know that. There's no one in America who wants to go to war with them. So what's the way out of this? Of this? Well, we've stood firm. But I have told him every time. I've said, look, we come to this, and if it is that good, uh, and we're going to deploy it, we see it as the basis then for eliminating the strategic ballistic missiles on both sides. And I have even told him that I would be willing to see this shared so that just as we all have gas masks <laughs> and uh, for, for go gas warfare, that all right, because if, if we set out and eliminated nuclear missiles on both sides, and there wouldn't be any reason not to treat this like a gas mask and let anyone that wanted have it, because we have to remember that we all know how to make those missiles now. And suppose we had come to an agreement where we'd done away with all the great ballistic missiles in the world. How can we know that someday there wouldn't be a madman in some country come along, another Hitler, for example, and suddenly, if you didn't have a defense, could suddenly threaten you with nuclear missiles when no one else had them? And therefore, he couldn't come along and do that if just like keeping our gas masks, if everybody had a defense. At your news conference last night, you were asked about uh, the ethics in government, and we led uh, our story with your response. My question's a little different. Uh, Mike Beaver, Lynn Nofsinger, who were convicted and who worked for you a long time, and I, of course, know them well from yeah. California. And uh, I, I wonder if what's happened to them, and plus the constant fire that Ed Meese seems to be under, whether you're, whether you're saddened by by, by what's happened here personally. Uh, well, of course, I'm, I'm saddened. Uh, first of all, I've, I've found all of those individuals to be the very soul of integrity in the more than 20 years that I've known them. Uh, I can't comment too specifically because these cases now are uh, in the courts and before the law and so forth. And uh, I don't know just exactly what I could do without, or how I could comment without uh, maybe causing uh, trouble for them. Uh, I want to see them all come out all right. And uh, yes, I'm saddened and for another reason. I have a feeling that there's a certain amount of politics involved in all of this, and I have a feeling that I'm really the target they would like to get at, and they're doing it by going after these other people. And as I cited last night, Ray Donovan, uh, Jim Beggs, 
both totally cleared of any wrongdoing whatsoever, but look at what they had to endure. And look at the campaign of vilification that went on for months and months that caused uh, Ray Donovan to say when finally he was declared totally innocent, is now where do I go to get back my reputation? Because you know the thing that is remembered by most people are all those charges and all those accusations. And somehow just the declaring of someone innocent, that's kind of lost in the, <laughs> in the background. You said for a very long time that you were going to remain neutral in this campaign, and I yeah. respect that very much. But as, as you know, uh, I, I'm sure that an overwhelming number of the voters who have supported Vice President Bush have been those voters, according to exit polls at least, uh, oh, who, who say they approve of your presidency. And without re regard to your stance of neutrality, which, which, which is, is stipulated uh, in this campaign, does, does, does Vice President Bush, does he carry on that legacy? Is that, does he, I mean, you've worked with him now for a long time. Well, Lou, trying to walk the, the thin line because, as you said, and, and in this office, you're titular head of the party, so therefore you have to be neutral in a, in a primary situation. But I would have to point out, to answer your question, I would have to point out that uh, George Bush, as vice president, has been a part of all that we've been doing. You see, when I became governor, I made up my mind that the lieutenant governor was not just going to be somebody sitting there waiting for me to, to get sick or die, uh, that he was going to be involved and used. Why do you let able-bodied manpower sit by? And the same thing's true with the vice president. I always felt that uh, both cases, the gubernatorial case and this one here, that that man should be like an executive vice president in a corporation. He should be involved in what was going on and have assignments and so forth. And that's been true in both in California and here in Washington. I have, I have just one last question. I, I wrote my first uh, story about you in 1965. And as you know, I've covered you uh, many yes. of the intervening years. And I wonder if you, as you look at your own uh, uh, quite considerable uh, career, but with the, especially uh, in the presidency, if there's something you're particularly uh, uh, accomplished and you're particularly proud of, and if there's any area where you feel uh, you, you, you have a regret or, or, or it hasn't come out the way you, you, you want it to come out. Well, yes, I could tell you some things that uh, struck my heart a, a number of times. On the other side of the accomplishment, I think uh, in these years here that the entire debate has been changed. That we once had a debate in which the two parties were divided as to one of them uh, battling for more and bigger government and the other one trying to at least hold the line if not reduce it. And in these several years, uh, the debate has been over uh, not over that at all. The debate has been over uh, how much do we cut. And uh, granted that they have uh, not wanted to cut as much as I did, interfered with that, but it has been a totally different debate. And uh, I think that's, that's good. And the, the fact that we have been able to, well, the Federal Register that contains all the regulations has 45% less pages than it had when we came here. Uh, we, have, we have eliminated uh, regulations and paperwork and so forth that was imposed upon the people, on local governments, on business and industry, to an estimated, that there's estimated 600 million man hours a year less of paperwork than there was when we came here. I am pleased that the thing that I had thought had to be rectified, the, the defense situation, that uh, we have a defense now that we didn't have before. And I think this has been what has made the change in the Soviet Union and their willingness to talk disarmament. In every meeting that I've had with the General Secretary, I have warned him that there's no way we will sit by and allow them to have a dangerous superiority over us. And the choice is either we reduce weapons, as we've done so far, or 
uh, we engage in an arms race, and I've told him that I don't think he can win that arms race if, if we're racing at the same time. So those things, yes, I think we've... What would, what would be your regret on the well, other side of that? Well, the regrets, to... there's one thing. That every time when you've had to order our young men to go into a position of danger and then to have a tragedy such as the one in Beirut, um, the terrible thing was they were actually succeeding in their mission. And that's why the violence was turned on them. The people that didn't want things brought to order in Beirut uh, started to resist, first by snipings and so forth, and then finally with that one thing where they took advantage of the uh, men being moved into that one building, found that with a suicide bomb, they could uh, car bomb, they could uh, cause all that death. The Challenger, I, in other words, I suppose put it down as the calls that have had to be made to families to who've lost someone, such as the tragic mistake of that Iraqi airplane and our ship in the Persian Gulf. Those are things for which you, you have to be very sorry. On the other hand, uh, I couldn't help, can't help but be proud that there is an island now down in the Caribbean where there aren't any signs Yankee go home, but where somebody sent me a postcard the other day, an American tourist from there. And the postcard that they're selling is a photograph of a wall and where the wall is painted with all kinds of graffiti and it is all graffiti about God love the USA and things of that kind. And that was uh, Grenada, of course. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Looking forward to this meeting with the NATO allies next week? Yes. I think that their people are probably suspicious.